So I want to give you a talk about chemiosmosis. And this is the one I promised you I'd post online. So I'm not quite sure how long this can go for, but we'll find out. So the main question that we're going to aim for with chemiosmosis is how electron transport in terms of the cell respiration as well as in the light dependent reactions. How is that actually used to produce ATP? Because so far I've kind of ignored it completely with cell respiration and flight dependent reactions I just kind of did a confusing mumbo jumbo of hey let's just ignore this magic of passing around electrons and hope for the best. But both of them culminate in the exact same thing which is producing ATP. So if I take a look what you get is cell respiration and what we have in cell respiration is we start off with glucose and we're going to add some oxygen somewhere supposedly. There's some oxygen right over there. And what I'm going to get out of this is some waters. I should get some CO2s. So we take glucose plus oxygen and we get out of it water and CO2. Hooray. But there are other things that we turn out to make in terms of glycolysis when we go from 1,3-bisphosphoglycerate or pardon me, from glycerol to 3 phosphate to the 1,3-bisphosphoglycerate, we produce NADH. When I go from pyruvate to acetyl-CoA, I produce NADH. And inside of the Krebs cycle, there's several instances where I make NADH and FADH2. All of those things need to get recycled, meaning NADH and FADH2 FADH need to be recycled, because if we don't, we shut down the cycle, the cycle, meaning the Krebs cycle. So we need some method of recycling. There's a similar thing that actually occurs in the light dependent reactions. So where we had photosystem 1, photosystem 2. So here there's a different thing that's being shown which is P680 and P700. This is making reference to the wavelength of light that these photosystems specialize in absorbing. So photosystem 2, also called P680, excuse me, is really good at absorbing at 680 nanometers of energy of light. P700 photosystem 1 is really good at absorbing at 700 nanometers of light. What happens here? We take an electron from photosystem 2, we zap it with light, it becomes energized, we pass that energized electron around like a hot potato until eventually it reaches photosystem 1, we re-energize it and we eventually dump that electron onto NADPH. Not NADH, but NADPH. The P actually stands for phosphate, but you can think of it like for photosynthesis. This NADPH, this here, needs to get recycled. If I don't have a method of recycling it, we get in trouble. Conveniently, there's a lot of cellular processes that utilize NADPH, and we don't talk about those, but this NADPH gets recycled. We ran out of electrons in order to do this, so what we have to do is add more electrons, and that's where when we take water, we rip it in half to form oxygen, protons, and electrons, so we can keep this cycle going. In the process of passing this electron around, we actually do some funky chemistry. In the process here, where we have our NADH and FADH2, those are, ener those are energy carriers or electron carriers, which means they're probably going to pass on electrons. The way they pass them around is what we call an electron transport chain. This here is a chain to move on electrons. So it's the same thing. It's an electron transport chain. The deal is, yesterday, I didn't really fully explain to you that whole oh, you can actually show off that, that you can absorb energy in electrons. And there's a fancy trick that exists, which is you can make a chlorophyll extract and then shine a black light on it. Black lights are UV, which means they have higher energy than does visible light. So what they can do is energize an electron. That energized electron either does something or it's going to give off light. Turns out, if you absorb light, you're going to give off something less powerful. So if I absorb UV light, I'm going to give off something in the red spectrum. What would that look like? This. So that's a chlorophyll extract. It's just spinach in alcohol and you let it bubble. So it's no big whoop de doo It's not difficult to do. I'll do this for you on Wednesday. He's showing off. It's amazing. But it's not hard to do.
So in there is a black light. So if you turn on the black light, you actually can't see a black light. That's because there's a coating on it to allow us to see it. But if you take the black light and put it next to chlorophyll, it actually turns red, even though this is not doing a great job showing it to you, but it actually turns red. And the reason for that is the chlorophyll is absorbing electrons, then giving off the energy, or pardon me, the chlorophyll's electrons are absorbing energy from the black light. It's giving off the, the energy in the form of red coloring. Yeah, that's not working so great for this guy. This should be a minute long, so it feels like it's been a minute. Also, that black light is a little warped because of how purple it is. I'll do this demo for you on Wednesday. You'll see. It's actually cooler than this video makes it look, but it's the best video I saw. So if I look at cell respiration at that inner mitochondrial membrane, which is all folded up in these things called Christi, so if it's all folded up, clearly we're trying to increase surface area. If we're trying to increase surface area, we're trying to increase whatever happens at that surface. What we find are a whole bunch of these protein complexes, and they're called complexes 1, 2, 3, and 4. We can go into lots of detail as to those complexes, but really it, it's that part's not super important. What happens at these complexes is these complexes are good for turning NADH back into NAD. So complexes, complex 1 recycles NADH back to NAD. When it does that, it gives up an electron. What happens in this process is we now have a high energy electron and we need to shove it along. The catch is if I'm moving an electron, I should get something for moving the electron around. And what it does is the electron, the high energy electron, provides energy for active transport. Active transport is when you move a substance against its concentration gradient, when you're forcing it into a space, when you're forcing concentration, when you're forcing a stockpiling. So what you end up having at complexes 1, 3, and 4 is protons get moved. Why protons? We'll get there. Complexes 1, 3, and 4 pump protons. Eventually, we have an electron that's kind of all pooped out. Where does it go? Well, if we take that electron, we combine it with some oxygen, we form water. Which is why, if we don't have oxygen, this process here doesn't work which means NADH can't get recycled, which means we shut down the Krebs cycle. Because if we don't have something to end the process, we can't go through and it just stockpiles and it ends. The FADH2 is found in complex 2, because when you go from succinate to fumarate, you make NAD or FADH2, which is a very short-lived electron intermediate, which is found right in here where you see the mouse spinning around. And it pumps protons in complexes 3 or 4. What does that mean? It's not as high energy as is NADH. Why? Because it pumps two of the three choices. We will notice a similar thing with the light-dependent reactions. So again, we have this hot potato of the electron. Its electron, its high energy, doesn't come from NADH. Instead, it's coming from light itself. What happens is the electron gets passed on from photosystem 2 to photosystem 1 and in that movement passes through a complex that pumps protons. The difference is here, what I'll notice is these protons here are being pumped from the matrix, so the inner space of the mitochondrion, out into the space between the two membranes, the intermembrane space. That's where we're pumping those protons. So whatever, if I could figure out a way to measure protons, I should notice a high concentration in that intermembrane space and not as much in the matrix. If I do the same thing for the light-dependent reactions, though we had those stacks of coins, the stack of the coin called a granum. Each individual coin shape is called a thylakoid, and there's a space on the inside, and we call that space the thylakoid space. What we notice is the inside of the thylakoids have a whole bunch of protons in it. So it has a high concentration of protons inside of the thylakoid, inside of those stacks. And we don't have as much in the space outside of the thylakoids, outside of the grana, outside of those stacks. We call that the stroma. 
what we do, we being plants, is we pump protons from the stroma into the thylakoid space. And when we do that, we have active transport again. The catch is, with this active transport, is something that's a little bit more complex and it's called a membrane potential. What we have is a separation of ions by concentration, meaning we'll have a lot of protons in one spot, a lot of no protons in another spot. So we have protons in one place, not another. We call that a concentration gradient. The word gradient just means there's a difference. That's all that's meant by the word gradient, is there's a difference. I'm fully aware that this picture here does not demonstrate that. It's actually sodium, sodium and potassium ions. That's because this is a different type of deal. We'll get that to later. The thing is, I'm also separating charges, because if I have a lot of protons in one spot, the other location doesn't have a lot of protons, and protons are positively charged. So if one space, meaning like the intermembrane space or the thylakoid space, has a lot of protons, has a lot of positive charges, that must mean in the other location, the stroma or the matrix, we must have a lot of negative charges, relatively speaking, because if one area is positive, we have to have an area be negative. You don't get the option of, uh-oh, everything becomes positive. If there's a positive, there has to be a negative somewhere. So what I end up having is a buildup of protons in one spot, and the protons are positively charged. The thing that happens is things move from high concentration to low concentration, and they move away from like charges to unlike charges. The protons do not want to be in the intermembrane space. They do not wish to be in the, stro in the thylakoid space for two reasons. Number one, there's a lot of protons there, and number two, they want to go to where there's negatives. Those two things combined create what we call a resting membrane potential. I'm lecturing for the class tomorrow, so they're hearing me say this. Period. Five, because I'm gone. Mr. Pham is waving, even though you can't see him waving. Maybe to... Actually, Be good. No. Go to school. No dating until you're married. That's his lesson of the day. What you generate is something called a resting membrane potential, meaning if I were to sit there and measure it, there's a battery to this. And I'm fully aware that this is a hard concept and it's weird. We're going to deal with this again. And conveniently, you have Ms. Donovan, who understands membrane potentials, and she's more than willing to probably talk it through with you. In us, in animals, we use it for our brains and for our muscles. But in plants, they also use resting membrane, or they use membrane potentials. In bacteria, they use membrane potentials. In paramecia, they use membrane potentials. In fungi, they use membrane potentials. All living things turn out to have membrane potentials. And what this video here is going to show you is called the shy plant, which is mimula. And it's kind of awesome because it's a visual of what happens when the membrane potential is utilized. So let me tell you what you all probably said, which was something to the effect of, oh, or whoa, or oh, I want to do that, or if you probably actually didn't say any of that stuff out loud, you probably thought it. But it's true. I, I, I've actually seen one of these plants before. They're insanely awesome. The catch is if you keep touching them, eventually you kill them because it turns out it takes energy to generate a membrane potential. It's actually a defensive mechanism because it's their ability to actually appear like they're wilting or they're kind of bad, so things don't eat them. What chemiosmosis is, is using this proton gradient, this uh, or proton motive force, or this membrane potential, MP membrane potential, to produce ATP. I didn't go through to find the video because it's annoying to do so. But what do we do? We happen to have a pump system. It forces protons into one location. We have a concentration difference. If we have all these positive charges, that must mean the other side is relatively negative. So we now have two reasons for these protons to wish to move from one spot across a membrane to another. 
If they had a method to move through, they gladly would. That system is called the ATP synthase. Sometimes called the, a the F0, F1 ATP synthetase, but let's call it the AP syn ATP synthase. What it turns out to be is a rotor, meaning it spins. And it turns out it had to have a head, so the F0 is this chunk, the F1 is this chunk over here. What this thing does is as protons move through it, it spins around. It actually physically spins. We can we have videos of this thing spinning. And this head twists in three positions. And it turns out to actually, like I said, have three positions. Kind of like if you were at Disneyland or Six Flags or Knott's Berry Farm or wherever, and you go through a turnstile. Turnstiles have three prongs to them. It's, I'm making some sh or shapes with my hands and you can't see it. I'm making like a, th like a triangle with my hands. And when you walk through a turnstile, it twists. And then another person walks through it and it twists again. Then you, another person walks through it and it twists again. And it takes three twists or three turns to make it go all the way th around in a loop. That's what this thing does. It takes three protons effectively to make this thing, actually technically it's six if I recall, but it doesn't matter. It takes three twists for this thing to go around. For those of you who took apes, I hope that you learned about alternative energy sources, and one of those would be things like wind turbines or, you know, uh, hydroelectric dams. And what those turn out to have is they use wind or they use water to run through a turbine, something that twists. And when you twist, you can produce energy. And if you can produce energy, you can do stuff. Well, what is this? We have protons flowing through basically a rotor, so so through those three prongs of a turnstile, and as it twists, it's going to produce energy. Rather than having that energy directly used, we can put it into a battery. We can charge up a battery, and that battery is turning ADP into ATP, slamming another phosphate onto the two phosphates of ADP to make adenosine triphosphate, to have, it have three phosphates. This process here is ingenious. It's absolutely ingenious. If instead of adding this stock part here where I have ATP, if I were to add a bacterial rotor to it, so like a flagellum, when the protons move, what I would see instead of making ATP is I would get a whipping tail. I now have an ability to swim. It's genius. It's absolute genius. We can use this to power anything we want. Bacteria do this, we do it, plants do it, fungi do it, protists do it. This is how ATP is produced inside of the mitochondrion. This is how ATP is produced inside of the chloroplast. We set up, we have an electron transport system. It sets up a whole bunch of protons in one spot, not many in the other, so we have an area where it's high concentration and it's positively charged, area with low concentration and thus by comparison negatively charged. These protons, if allowed to move, will move. They move through a rotor that spins. When it spins, it's like a turnstile and if you get a twisting turnstile, you can generate energy. And that's what the cell does. It turns ADP into ATP. We add a phosphate on and that makes ATP or our cellular energy. What do you do with ATP? whatever you want. It's genius. The catch is, from your presentations from last week, is we actually have a hormone in animals called thyroxin, and that comes from your thyroid gland, which is found in your neck. And what it does is it does something we call thermal uncoupling, meaning we happen to have the mitochondrion, because that's where it's going to matter. This doesn't matter for plants. What we can do is we have our electron transport chain, we establish our proton gradient, so we have charge gradient, we have concentration gradient. We want this thing to move through the ATP synthase and make ATP for us. Hooray. So we're burning energy, so we're burning fats, we're burning sugars, we're burning proteins to produce energy. What would happen if I had a bypass of the ATP synthase? Because ATP synthase, the protons have to go through and they have to twist. But if there's a bypass, meaning I don't need to go through a rotor, I can just dump through a hole, 
Well, that's easier. We'll take the path of least resistance. So the protons, if given an option, will gladly move through a uncoupling protein, UCP, uncoupling protein. And when it moves on through, the protons just move. They don't produce energy, but what we're doing instead is we establish a proton gradient, and the protons dump on back. What can we do? Just do it again. And as long as we have this system going, we're not producing energy, we're instead producing heat. Why are we doing that? Because we're not making energy, we are just making heat. We're burning food for the sake of burning food. That's what we call a thermal uncoupling. Thermal, produce heat. Uncoupling, we are separating the electron transport chain from ATP production. The, we, if we can separate and remove ATP production, all we do is do this electron transport chain thing to produce heat. For those of you who sit there, eat whatever you want, and you don't get fat, that's because you're not turning the food you burn into energy. And then if you, uh-oh, you didn't use your energy, we need to store it somewhere, so we store it in the form of fat as animals. What you do instead is you burn your food and you lose it as heat because you're not turning it into ATP. Your body's still saying, hey, wait a second, I need my ATP. So it has to do more of this burning, more electron transport, to make enough of a proton gradient so that ATP synthase gets used. What triggers the formation of the uncoupling protein? Thyroxin, which is a hormone that comes from your thyroid gland. Its job is to have a thermal uncoupling to make you burn your energy, burn your fuel sources just to produce heat, not for energy for your cells to function. So if you need energy for your cells to function, you need to burn even more. If you don't produce much thyroxin, Everything you burn gets turned into ATP, which means if you don't use it up, it lodges on as fat. Those of you who make a lot of thyroxin, you can't eat enough because everything you're doing is being lost as heat, so you're not making that much energy, so we have to do even more of this. Hooray and a hip hip. It's actually a very brilliant system, but that's how we produce ATP. The same process in both chloroplasts and mitochondria. It's called chemiosmosis.